Can we get started uh, on our next panel, please? Folks, can we get started we, uh, on our next panel? If, if, if everyone can take your seats. What's our order? What I would appreciate if everyone yeah, could just take your seats. <laughs> what does Captain Sam say? <laughs> okay. So the next panel uh, is on uh, epidemiology and the changing nature of uh, proof in mass torts. Uh, and it's going to be moderated by Sam Isakaroff, who's uh, sitting here at my left. Sam is one of the uh, faculty co-directors of the Center on Civil Justice. In fact, he, along with Sheila, uh, was uh, uh, the, uh, the moving force behind the creation of uh, the Center on Civil Justice here at NYU. And uh, he embodies uh, as does Sheila, uh, but in particular Sam uh, embodies one of the core principles of the center, which is the marriage of uh, academics and practitioners. And Sam is both. Uh, as uh, you certainly already know, Sam is uh, one of the foremost proceduralist academics in America, and he's also one of the most uh, involved practicing attorneys in the uh, areas that uh, we're talking about uh, today in the, in the sphere of complex litigation. So, Sam, I'm turning it over to you and you can uh, take it from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, so let me, uh, before I introduce the, the panel, let me introduce the topic a little bit with uh, two statistics. One you heard in the last panel, and there's different ways of slicing and dicing the numbers, but basically the MDL process has grown to include roughly 40% of the active civil docket of the federal court system. This is a, a figure which it took me about three or four years of hearing it repeated by uh, various judges, now by Sarah Vance, who, uh, who's the chief judge of the MDL panel, who gives the statistic all the time. And it took us several years before it sunk in, just the magnitude of that, that this seemingly bywater that we used to not even mention in procedure courses has now grown to be so dominant. The other statistic, though, is what are the MDL cases? And um, a few years ago, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Joint Panel on Multidistrict Litigation asked me and Dave Proctor to put together a report on what this looks like. And we had the assistance of Emory Lee and the Federal Judicial Center, and we actually went probing inside the various MDLs and to look at what the cases were. And it turns out that 92% of the cases in the MDLs were something that we would call a mass harm case, or more, and most of them were mass tort cases. And so a lot of them are cases that, you know, are high profile. They are the, the VW uh, uh, recall cases, the BP Deepwater Horizon spill, NFL, the transvaginal mesh litigation. Uh, these are very high profile, but a lot of the cases that are in the MDLs are cases that we've parked there as the way of handling mass torts. And these are cases you have a pharmaceutical product that's alleged to call, cause a harm. Sometimes the harm is a signature harm that can easily be traced to it, but a lot of times it's not. It's just an increased risk of heart attack or, or some other kind of common ailment that uh, has to be tested epidemiologically. And in these cases, the MDL courts do one thing brilliantly well, and one thing that we just still are trying to feel our way around, the thing they do brilliantly well is that by putting all these cases together, the scope of the cases matches the scope of the science. The cases look like a microcosm of the epidemiological study that we're relying on to prove or disprove the, the claimed harm. Um, there is still, however, all the cases about who, all the questions about who gets paid. Who was actually injured? We heard Vioxx mentioned before. There were 20 million people who took Vioxx in the United States. 
Of those, we would normally expect somewhere on the order of 120,000 adverse cardiac events from that population. The, there were, we knew that we were getting somewhere around 150 and 100, or to 160,000 adverse cardiac events in that population. The dispute between the plaintiffs and defendants were, the numbers are, are more complicated, but I'm just rounding them off. The, there were, the dispute between the plaintiffs and defendants was whether it was 150 or 160,000. It wasn't that it, nobody thought it was still at 120,000. But among the population, we had very little clue as to who was adversely affected if they had a heart attack or a stroke, and uh, who simply had drew the short straw of life, who had genetic markers that predisposed them to it, all these sorts of things. And so what, the, what aggregating does well <coughs> is it lets the judge, the court, one judge, one court, focus on the science, and we have two extremely experienced uh, judges with us today who've handled this extensively. Uh, judge St. Eve, who has uh, one of the, is one of the few judges who has both the experience of handling this as an MDL judge at the trial level and is now on the Court of Appeals on the Seventh Circuit, which means that uh, she sees it from both ends. She's been on the, on the, on the appellate court only a short time, but the, the importance of this it was alluded to in the last panel because relatively few of our appellate judges have seen the MDL process in any way or have an, any real appreciation uh, for it. And uh, Judge Kennelly of the uh, Northern District of Illinois has handled some of these big cases. And if you want, really want to get a feel for how this epidemiology plays out, I would commend to you his opinions handling the science in the testosterone MDL, where the, the ability to filter through the difficult scientific questions and this great tension between general and specific causation uh, was really played out. Uh, we're going to begin the panel with the academics. The academics are to my left, uh, Nora Engstrom from uh, uh, Stanford Law School, who is, I think, the best new uh, person writing in procedure on what the bar actually does and how these cases actually play out. I, it's, there's a freshness to her writing, and so I'm very happy to hear her. And at the other end is John Witt of uh, Yale Law School, whose stuff is much more tired, uh, frankly, but, uh, but uh, and <laughs> John and I go back a long way. We wrote an article together some years ago. We were colleagues at Columbia, so um, I can give him grief. So we'll start with Nora and then John and then uh, turn to our distinguished judges. Great, thanks Sam and thanks uh, to, to so many of the organizers uh, for organizing this really, really terrific uh, day and a half of conversation. Um, so our panel topic is the problem of proof in mass torts, um, and, which kicks off a, you know, a lot of problems I think that we'll talk about that Sam has introduced. Um, one component of that problem um, is to ensure that the plaintiffs who complain about injury from a particular drug, device, contaminant, or product are in fact genuinely injured by defendants, um, that there hasn't been fabrication or gross exaggeration of uh, the plaintiff's injury. Um, and of course, and on the furthest end of such fabrication or gross exaggeration, that would go by another name, right, which would be fraud. Um, so fraud in the mass tort world is a bit taboo. It is not something uh, most academics, at least, like to talk about or to think about. Um, but evidence suggests it is a problem, and this was brought up actually a little bit in the last panel in well, as well. So in fact, while fraud generally in the tort liability system is a very small problem, um, the vast majority, all the evidence we have suggests that the vast majority of tort claims within the system writ large are genuine and meritorious. Um, there are two corners of the personal injury liability system where fraud is a bigger deal. So those two corners, and actually if you think about kind of the dollar involved, lots of different things, they'd be opposite ends of the continuum. One is uh, soft tissue injury car wreck cases. Soft tissue injury car wreck cases, these are things like sprains, strains, uh, sprains, strains contusions, and whiplash. Fraud is a much bigger deal. We have a bunch of studies which suggest that. The other area, the you know, far different area when you think about the sophistication of the lawyers or the size of the claims, uh, these are our mass tort claims, the subject of our discussion. 
Um, when it comes to mass torts, many injury victims have a genuine and serious impairment, but whether of their own volition or as a result of recruitment efforts by shady lawyers or claims brokers, others are going to sense a payday and, and get sucked in. So claiming that they sustain serious injuries that are either non-existent, uh, grossly exaggerated, or unrelated to the instant defendant's conduct. So I call this oversubscription. I think it's important to think about uh, fraud and kind of slice and dice it, and I've done that in a recent article, but what this area I call is oversubscription. So no empirical study quantifies oversubscription's prevalence, but it is, appears that it has plagued uh, many and, and, and probably most of our prominent mass torts, including Fenfen, asbestos, silica, Vioxx, breast implant litigation, the 9-11 first responder litigation, and litigation following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So why is the mass tort, I said you know, most of the world actually frauds a very small problem, like the fraudulent Ben Mal claim is not really a thing, people aren't bringing those claims. Why is this a bigger deal in the mass tort realm? So I chalk it up to five factors. Um, in the mass tort realm, unlike in most other areas of tort law, many have injuries that are hard to discern or to verify. Um, just to say, you know, the idea is, does this claimant really have lung damage? How severe? How can we tell? Actually, those kinds of scans are very difficult to read reliably. Um, in the mass tort realm, unlike in most other areas of law, specific causation is contestable. You know, this is what Sam was just talking about. We know, okay, if we believe there's lung damage, where did the lung damage come from? Is it really from defendant's product? Um, Next, defendants swamped with claims have a diminished incentive or capacity to screen those claims. Um, fourth, unlike in most other areas, claim rates are high. Within most of the tort system, actually very, very, very few plaintiffs with genuine claims actually seek compensation for those claims. In the med mal world, for example, it's about 2%, um, not so in the mass tort realm. And five, um, and, and this I think is, is the most important factor, um, restraints generally imposed by the contingency fee are relaxed or inoperative. Um, so on this last point, once a mass tort has reached uh, maturity, uh, this is the Francis McGovern term of maturity, any additional client added to the, to the lawyer's inventory is essentially all upside. So the marginal client poses little, if any, risk, demands little by way of out-of-pocket investment, offers the possibility of a substantial fee, and because some defendants are more likely to settle or willing to settle if there are a whole bunch of claims there, um, might actually even strengthen the lawyer's hand in settlement negotiations. So in that environment, Judge Jack Weinstein has, has colorfully called this the vacuum cleaner effect which it makes sense for some lawyers to suck up the good claims and the bad claims, hoping to settle in gross. Um, so what to do? Uh, when, when confronted with, with suspicious or fraudulent claims, courts already have at their <coughs> disposal an array of resources, um, including you know, Rule 11, 12B6, 60B3, 56, 28 U.S.C. 1927, they can impose sanctions under their inherent authority, and we've seen some of that. Um, obviously, searching expert review uh, via Daubert, uh, and uh, in some cases, Federal Rule of Evidence 706. Um, meanwhile, effective par affected parties on the defendant side have a bunch of self-help mechanisms which they have not been shy about using. They can file malicious prosecution lawsuits, retaliatory RICO lawsuits, there's been an uptick in that, um, file a grievance with state bar disciplinary committees, um, refer the case for criminal prosecution. So one additional tool lawyer or the judges are now using um, increasingly is Lone Pine orders. So invented by a state court judge down the road in New Jersey um, when he issued an unpublished order in a 1986 case the case involved a landfill, which is now a Superfund site. Um, these orders are a case management tool, very much of the Judith Resnick managerial judging kind of style, um, that a judge files, and when he does, he requires plaintiffs to define their claims and, and offer evidence to support their claims early in the litigation sometimes even prior to the start of discovery. So typically issued under the authority of Rule 16, the orders can act as a procedural sieve. Um, so as such, they require plaintiffs to supply certain evidence um, 
both of a qualifying injury and sometimes a certain uh, a specific causation information by a specified date. Um, and in so doing, they essentially require plaintiffs you know, to put up or shut up under penalty of dismissal. So these Lone Pine orders, which appear to be, it's always hard to know what's happening out there in the real world when things aren't resulting in unpublished decisions, particularly in state court, um, but in my review so far, they seem to be becoming quite popular. Um, they can certainly be beneficial. So loan, court, co loan pine orders that have said help courts to zero in on and address gaps in the plaintiff's evidence. Um, this early scrutiny can save defendants, you know, time, money, and aggravation, can serve scarce judicial resources, expedite the resolution of claims, safeguard the integrity of trial processes, um, and less obviously assist those plaintiffs with valid claims who will benefit by not having to share court time, settlement funds, or frankly, counsel table uh, with those with dodgy entitlements. Um, but I will also sound a note of caution. Um, to this point, there has been a, something of a consensus in favor of Lone Pine orders, at least in the literature. Uh, so many have written to extol their virtues, while few have taken a critical look. Um, in fact, the most vocal critics of Lone Pine orders so far that I can find are an intermediate state court appellate judge uh, in California who wrote a very strong dissent in 1992 um, and two short, very good, but short student notes. Um, so I'm in the process of writing a new piece that seeks to at least complicate this inquiry. So for one, when you get under the hood of Lone Pine orders, uh, when you look at the many, many cases where they have been issued, um, it's, it's apparent that courts talk about these things like they are a thing, right? Like they have these like clear shape and size when we know them, um, but in fact, they have very little understood uh, content. Uh, there is striking disagreement about whether a case is amenable to entry of a Lone Pine order, how big a case needs to be before one is appropriate, whether these orders are only appropriate where there's already some kind of cloud over the plaintiff's claim, like a, like a in, in some cases, like there'll be an EPA finding that there's only contamination here and the plaintiffs are all over there. Um, and on the other hand, there are, some, there are some judges who just say these orders ought to be routinely filed. Um, then assuming a Lone Pine order is appropriate, there is wide disagreement about when an order should be issued. Many courts say before discovery, before any discovery takes place. Other courts say once discovery is well underway. Um, finally, once we decide a Lone Pine is appropriate and when it should be filed, the content of these it orders really varies as well. Some are bare bones and require information that would reasonably be within a diligent plaintiff's possession, such as information regarding um, exposure to the product. You know, I really did take Biox, and here's the prescription uh, and diagnosis. Here's the diagnosis I got from my doctor. Um, others go much further and demand competent evidence of specific causation, which as Sam just noted, goes right to the crux of many mass tort cases. Um, and when there's no signature disease, like mesothelioma would tell us there's an asbestos case, may be pretty close for an impossible for an individual plaintiff to assemble, particularly early on, again, prior to discovery. So this lack of consistency opens the door, of course, to the typical problems where we see things all over the map, lack of horizontal equity, um, unpredictability, and the possibility of arbitrary or even abusive decision making. Um, so beyond the inconsistency, when you drill down on Lone Pine orders, you see other drawbacks too. Um, so first, <laughs> Lone Pine orders, they're just, you know, so far with a couple very rare exceptions, just, injure, uh, just uh, filed against plaintiffs. Um, in fact, they're described by commentators we were talking about these as a really good thing, as a weapon defendants can wield against plaintiffs. Um, and as such, they risk slanting the playing field in a way I think that is, uh, could be unequal and inequitable. Um, second, the orders are worrying and they have the capacity to alter the normal rules of litigation by essentially triangulating discovery disputes. So you think of discovery disputes as somewhat binary, the plaintiff and the defendant are fighting, but here all of a sudden the plaintiff is fighting with the court about what the plaintiff has to uh, reveal. 
Um, and third, and this is what worries me the most, uh, there is a serious concern that if a court issues a Lone Pine order and then dismisses the plaintiff's claim for failure to comply with that Lone Pine order, which again, there are lots of cases that have done this, um, the court will you know, effectively hand the victory to the defendant, but the court will have done so while depriving plaintiffs of the numerous finely tuned procedural safeguards embedded within Rule 12b6 <coughs> or Rule 56, and in fact turning standard burdens on their head, uh, while also effectively um, insulating its dispositive ruling from meaningful appellate review. And that's because a dismissal for one of these orders would be reviewed under abuse of discretion rather than de novo as it would be for 56 or 12b6. Um, so ultimately, I think where, I'm, where, I, where my own thinking is on this stuff is that, you know, like so many things in modern life, uh, a little when it comes to Lone Pine orders probably goes a long way. Um, I'll su suggest concrete ways the scheme should be and I think can be tweaked. Um, so our overarching goal, I think, as we think about these, this needs to be to strike a balance between scrutinizing claims, ensuring the integrity of our trial processes, um, but also not erecting artificial or insurmountable barriers to plaintiff's recovery in the process of doing so. Wow, thank you. Uh, th this picks up exactly on where the last panel left off because one of the virtues of the MDL process is it's supposed to lower the transactional costs to uh, mass claims that are, that are related in some fashion, but we live in a strategy-rich strategy environment in which sophisticated players respond to the incentives that are put before them. You lower the cost of entry too much and then you get hedge funds, funders who can go out and solicit claims, file them directly into the MDL, and basically swamp the process with claims of uh, questionable merit and or that haven't been tested in the normal attorney-client uh, uh, way. Um, this is, uh, I now have 10 questions at least for the judges, but let's, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's have John first. Uh, uh, on why we do all this stuff. Uh, th thank, th thanks, uh, Sam. It's, um, I, I was thinking what the right metaphor is to describe my presence here. I was thinking fish out of water was, was one of the places I was going to go. I, I think better, I think better uh, anthropologist assigned to study some interesting tribe who then finds himself presenting his results to the tribe, <laughs> to the tribe. So I hope you'll uh, you'll be uh, be patient with me. I wanted to start where um, uh, where the brilliant Alexi Lahav was uh, in the first in the first panel, where she described two different bodies of law, ostensibly about different things: aggregate litigation on the one hand, bankruptcy on the other, that turn out in large part in some uh, parts of the world to be about the same thing: finding ways to bring efficient resolution to some uh, area of mass harm. Uh, then Arthur Miller added in arbitration is another piece. Uh, Nora has just talked about the law of evidence and uh, various other piece, pieces of the law of procedure. And what, what I wanted to do in um, the next couple minutes was suggest from the perspective of a torts teacher and a legal historian uh, uh, of, the, of the litigation process, uh, that it's not just these two, three, or four bodies of law that we might be thinking about as shaping the ways in which we resolve uh, uh, mass harm kinds of situations, but rather that in, in, a, in a world of private entrepreneurial lawyers, some of whom are, are in this room, uh, where we allow parties to drive uh, the process rather than, rather than judges, although judges have, a, have an important role, um, and where we have party discretion over settlement, that many, many bodies of law will end up being centrally about shaping the settlement of classes of cases in the aggregate. So here's a here's a um, uh, a tentative thesis for 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 the um, uh, for you members of the tribe to consider. It's that the, the mass tort MDL uh, is the tip of an iceberg. The, the, the MDL is not radically different from the run of tort cases in the United States. Instead, uh, the MDLs are the visible piece 
of a massive, largely invisible, highly decentralized system of aggregate settlement of tort claims, a, a hidden structure of private administration operating against the backdrop uh, or in the shadow of, uh, as, um, as I, I know folks at NYU would like to say, uh, the, the, the law. Um, so one of the great advantages then of the MDL from a scholar's perspective uh, is that it's become a site where we can see otherwise hidden features of the legal system uh, more, more generally. In particular, I think, it's a place where we can see that American litigation isn't so much a field for adversarial individualism, but rather of private aggregation and managed administration in which the, the bar, the bar plays an administrative uh, managerial uh, role. Um, uh, we can, this might, this reason to think this might be true uh, is that MDL proceedings, uh, insofar as I understand them and the experts are here in the room, essentially resolve disputes through settlement without remand to trials uh, in, the, um, uh, in the original federal district courts. Uh, something like 3% of uh, cases get, uh, uh, get uh, consolidated cases are getting remanded. Those that do get remanded are also settling before they're tried to verdict virtually all the time. Um, uh, consider the GM ignition switch cases that uh, um, uh, Ken, Ken Feinberg described earlier. 4,000 personal injury claimants, as I understand it, uh, before Judge Furman, uh, just a few blocks downtown. Uh, the number of personal injury claimants bringing their uh, trials to verdict so far is two. Two. So the, the, the um, uh, cases are being resolved by settlement, not by... Um, not by trial. And the funny thing is these patterns are not distinctive to the MDL. These are the patterns we see in civil litigation more generally. As you all well know, civil litigation, especially tort litigation, uh, is dominated by, um, uh, by, by settlement rather than by trial to verdict. So the result is the MDLs look a whole lot like ordinary cases. They settle uh, only with greater visibility. Now, the, the, the vanishing trial poses something of a challenge for folks in my field, uh, teaching and writing about tort law. So for decades in torts, scholars have described many features of tort doctrine as essentially being about allocating obligations and, and work between judges and juries. That, that's, that's what a lot of tort doctrines do. Think of a, a race ipsa loquitur, which was the happy subject of my last torts class just, uh, just on, uh, on Thursday. This is a doctrine of circumstantial evidence. It, it governs when a plaintiff has managed to, to make out a pre if she cases and is going to get to a jury past a judge. But think of any number of, um, of, of, of tort doctrines, negligence per se versus a general test for, um, uh, for reasonableness, or the difference between rules on the one hand uh, and standards on the other. These are ways of policing the relationship between judge and jury. Um, but what are we to make of that idea, which has really been important and influential for tort teachers for a long time, in a world in which there just aren't juries anymore? We don't do the work of allocating between judges and juries in a world in which so many cases are, um, are settling. Um, so the, the vanishing trial causes us to develop, calls on us, I think, to, to develop a new theory of what the substantive law of torts, but actually lots of other fields uh, are um, uh, uh, what the substantive law is doing. And so with a co-author and a student of mine at Yale, Nathaniel Donahue, who's in the back over here, hi Nathaniel, um, I'm writing a paper uh, uh, titled Tort Law as Private Administration, which is designed to identify an answer to this puzzle of what to do with these tort doctrines that were once thought to be about judge and jury. Uh, if once upon a time substantive tort doctrine was structure, structured the relations between judge and jury, the, the theory that Nathaniel and I are, are offering is that now substantive tort doctrines uh, structure the relations between plaintiffs and defense side negotiators and settlement agents in this far-flung system of private administration that is, um, that is uh, uh, American, uh, large swaths of American law. Um, in, you know, in one sense, every piece of an available legal system shapes the settlement value, the, the, the price of a claim, in the same way that every piece of material information shapes the price of a share in a publicly traded firm. Um, uh, what Nathaniel and I are especially interested though, in though are those pieces of the substantive law that help to condition and structure the settlement system in the aggregate around classes rather than around individualized inquiries and individualized, um, individualized pricing. So constructing settlement as a field of repeat players positioned to construct and then participate in the kinds of, the kinds of settlement systems that you all are familiar with from the MDLs, but even in ordinary run-of-the-mill uh, auto accidents and the like. So 
Here's some examples of some of the kinds of doctrines we are thinking about. I think the most important one is the, the familiar, so familiar it just fades into the backdrop rule of vicarious liability or respondeat superior. So one way to, this has always been a puzzle for, um, for, uh, for, for tort, tort jurists. One way to think of what uh, respondeat superior is doing is it's bringing in repeat players front and center at the very beginning of a case. It produces large uh, re repeat play entities in the place of individualized employees on the defense side of the um, of the litigation, but there are other ones too. Uh, so the, uh, dam in the damages uh, uh, world, the rule of lump sum, lump sum one-time damages, making actual plaintiffs whole, uh, facilitates the use of actuarial tables generated by statisticians to help produce aggregate resolutions and aggregate pricing for claims. Uh, rules like subrogation rules are, are, are rules that bring in Repeat, repeat players once again, now on the plaintiff side, uh, to help uh, um, uh, produce repeat players on both sides who are interested in classes and aggregates. Or just last, for, for our purposes here, uh, doctrines in the, in, in the law of causation, um, like causal link, which substantially enlarge the field of defendant actors who might get caught up in tort claims and sweeps in more institutions uh, on the defense side of the, um, of the, lever, of, of, of the ledger. What, one, one more, joint and several liability. What is joint and several liability doing? Well, one thing it's doing is it's implicating large repeat play institutions and making them central players in settlements even when their share of the causal contribution or their share of the fault might be relatively slight. Um, now, to be sure, sometimes settlement against the backdrop of all these doctrines is bespoke and tailored to particular cases. Uh, medical malpractice cases, for example, might follow this, um, this path. But in lots of other domains, settlements are products of what are effectively aggregate systems for the resolution of claims in which parties are using stereotyped versions of facts without in-depth individual inquiry in order to generate quick and dirty and efficient settlement values. Um, uh, each of the doctrines I just described, I think, facilitate the production of these sorts of privately administered aggregate settlement structures. And then look what we see when we look into the world of uh, settlement resolution. We see rules of thumb developed by the bar, proxies, implicit grids, uh, rules of thumb like rear-enders produce settlement uh, without regard to any further inquiry, or general damages are three times specials, or um, uh, any number of rules that the bar has worked out for the resolution of otherwise difficult to figure out tort claims. Now, one, one implication, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll close with this, uh, with this uh, idea, although there's lots more that Nathaniel and I have to say, I, I hope, um, but one implication of this is that the occasional trial that does happen in the tort system um, looks a little bit like the bellwether cases that the MDLs are producing. That is, the bellwether cases in an MDL are designed to produce some kind of a sense of settlement value for the settling out of the rest of the well, I can't say class, but the rest of the, um, of, of the, of, of the group. Um, and in some ways, the, the trial in ordinary personal injury litigation plays the same function. Uh, in writing and, and, and studying the, the origins of the plaintiff sidebar in the middle of the 20th century, this is one of the, the, um, uh, one of the pieces that I encountered, which I was most interested in, was the idea of trial balloon cases, in which the settlement systems operated by local plaintiff's attorneys would be repriced, the prices would be updated by an occasional trial allowed to go through to see what juries think the prices of this kind of case uh, uh, might be now. Um, so, so the MDL, Bellwether, is in some ways a, um, a way of understanding the occasional trial that goes on in the ordinary civil justice system uh, um, uh, uh, ordinarily. And then last, to, to continue on this bellwether, the MDL is itself a kind of bellwether. That is, the MDL process is a bellwether by which we, that is to say, we strange anthropologists of what it is that you all are doing, can try to make sense of what the civil justice system looks like more generally in a sense of being a privately administered in the aggregate far-flung uh, um, uh, body for the resolution of cases with now very few trials, with now very few trials. Um, so, so the idea is MDL as, a, as bellwether. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from the, from the, the, the judges. And, um, and thank you for, uh, uh, for listening. Uh, OK, so we have um, the pressures toward treating the many as certain categories, either through the Lone Pine or through the very fact of the aggregation, which is inevitable in our system to go back to the title that John and I used in our article together uh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so Judge St. Eve, uh, 
you've there's very little appellate law in this area. It's one of the, the, the you know, the Rule 23F opened up the courts of appeals for the class action process, but there's nothing similar on the MDL side. So there's very little appellate law. So this all happens at the, at the MDL transferee court level. You've handled the number of these, including the, the mass harm ones. Um, how do you organize, what do you, what's, what's your thought on any of this, but things like science days, Lone Pine orders, how do you get to the heart of a case, of a huge case with thousands of potentially injured parties? Well, if you take a step back and think about what's the MDL judge's role, our judge really, is, our role really is to manage these cases and move them forward. And it makes sense when you think about that, that the focus is really on general causation, not the specific causation of the individual plaintiffs in our role of moving them forward because if the defendants can raise a general causation challenge, it put that's the biggest bang for their buck. Because if they can raise a general causation challenge up front and knock out a class or a group of people from the MDL, that's much more efficient for them and cost effective than trying to pick off a plaintiff by plaintiff. So that makes sense, and that makes sense in what we do. Um, a couple general comments on, first of all, the lone pine orders, which in these massive cases, I think are a good idea. Uh, but the question I would have is, well, what's the judge's role once those are filed? Because I think that would dictate some of these procedural issues that are being raised. Is it something we should sue a sponte, start dismissing plaintiffs on if they say they didn't take the drug? Are these really the beginning of discovery issues? And in some sense, they're like your 26A1 initial disclosures, which the rules provide for, that you turn over the initial information about your plaintiff, and that's the beginning of discovery. So then the defendants can take it from there and follow up on discovery or bring whatever motions they want to the court's attention. So is that something the court should be jumping in on initially or just using these as a mandatory discovery procedure, which I think could change the analysis in the role of the Lone Pine orders. Uh, to comment, John, on your, your argument about the trial and how things have really changed because of the vanishing trial, I don't think Judge Kennelly would say the trial is vanishing. <laughs> you can ask him how many trials he's had this year alone. Uh, but I don't think you can look at this as totally, it's becoming a private dis um, negotiation between the plaintiffs and defendants without thinking about the overlay of a trial. Well. Because there's nothing from a judge's standpoint that settles a case like setting a firm trial date. So if you, that's what's moving some of these things faster. Why the parties don't want to try things, there are all sorts of theories on that. But I do think that threat of the trial, the risk of the trial, the fear of the trial is what is pushing these settlements along. Because without that, then you don't have that same hammer. So I don't think you lose control of that. Um, in terms of the science, if you want me to, to keep going. Yeah, I, I, I think that the, the, the question is that you have a, a reservoir of experience, which for people here we just don't have access to. How do you think about a case that comes in your court that you know is, is going to be heavily driven by the science, the causation is uncertain, uh, the specific issues we'll probably never get to. Um, how, how do you conceptualize, how do you organize, what do you do? Well, it's interesting because I was a district court judge for 16 years in Chicago and handled multi, multiple MDLs. And I would say the last two years, I started to see a push, not just in MDLs, but in any real complex case, uh, from the defense side of trying to push the expert discovery earlier and earlier, sometimes before the fact discovery or simultaneous with the fact discovery. So there is, on these complex cases, there is more of an emphasis on the science. And for us, we are not scientists. Uh, we are generalists in, in most areas. And so for us, the challenge is, how do we educate ourselves on the science? Because the science will dictate how we rule on certain things. And so it's important for us to understand what that underlying science is. 
So I know many judges, including myself and, and Judge Kennelly, because we've done it together before, have started doing early on in cases what are called science days. And if you haven't asked for one of those with your judges, I would certainly encourage you to ask for that. And essentially what that is, is an education of us. You come in with your, your PowerPoints or your experts or however you want to explain what the underlying science is and explain it to us so that we have at the start of the case an initial understanding of what's at issue. So when we're ruling on motions, uh, whatever the motion might be, and I don't just mean Daubert's, but the motion to dismiss, the discovery issues, the motions in limine, that we have that basic understanding of what the science is. I found that incredibly helpful in all of these cases. And to, and to do it early, not to wait until we get later on, or not to wait until after fact discovery is over or almost done, because that basic education up front can help or certainly helped me in ruling going forward on the issues coming before the court. Now I might have follow-up questions or when a second science day as we get deeper into it when I have a better understanding or the issues, different issues start coming up, but that first basic education is really invaluable in these cases. And what about the, the question of getting a, a, a survey of the population, because the thing that an MDL has, unless it has embedded class actions in it, is it has a finite number of claimants, because to be consolidated, somebody has to file the claim somewhere. Um, what about getting a survey of the population, whether it's a full Lone Pine or something like that, just a plaintiff fact sheet, you know, tell me who you are, how old you are, what disease you claim to have, what your exposure was, when it took place, uh, things of that sort. Is that, is that something that's become routine? It has, I don't know if it's routine as much, but it has certainly become more popular and becoming more and more, now that we're hearing more challenges and as you mentioned, third party financing coming in and a perception that it's easier to jump into these MDLs, it's easier to bring claims that don't have merit. So judges are trying to figure out, well, how do we police these at an earlier stage in managing the cases? I think those are very helpful. And again, I would analogize it to the Rule 26A1 disclosures. It's the beginning of discovery. Those are basic issues that you should know before you bring a lawsuit and they're going to be required under discovery, and if you go back and look at what's in Rule 26A1, a, a lot of that overlaps with, what, with what's in these initial fact sheets or loan pine orders. So, uh, Judge Kennelly, um, the, the testosterone case I found fascinating because you have a class of uh, 50 to 60 year old men, 50 men in their 50s and 60s, which I take to be a group that I find near and dear to my heart, um, and uh, they are at risk of uh, adverse cardiac events, which is, you know, we all wake up every morning terrified that it was our day, you know, and, um, and so um, uh, there's nothing unique about men in their 50s and 60s fearing heart attacks, right? Okay. So what, so you have now uh, exposure to some testosterone enhancement that cla is claimed to elevate the risk. And how do you, so this is the, this is the case, you know, no signature disease at all as far as I, as far as I understand the, the facts. I have no involvement in the case as far as I understand the facts. And so how do you go about taking something which is absolutely endemic to the class population that you're dealing with and trying to figure out whether there's a case there at all, what cases might be worth, how do you, how do you get to from the general epidemiology to any kind of specific issue, how you set up bellwethers, you had to screen client, uh, plaintiffs to determine whether they survived summary judgment enough to go to a bellwether, how do you go about doing that? Uh, well, so first of all, let me say, I think, I, with all respect to Professor Wood, I think I'm actually the odd man out on this panel. So I got my boss sitting on my left. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got on the far ends two people who get to like, step back and think deep thoughts about what does it all mean. And, and I, 
I sometimes analogize my job to those of you who may have seen the famous uh, I Love Lucy episode where Ethel and Lucy are working in the candy factory. And, <laughs> and the candies are coming down and they have to wrap them up and put them on the thing. And the candies keep coming down faster and faster. And they're putting the candies in their hat and in their mouth and in their pockets and whatever. And eventually they start falling off. I think, that's my job. <laughs> uh, I am Lucy and Ethel. Um, so, so the, the, the short answer to Sam's question is there's no, there's no one way to do it, and I, with, uh, with respect to the members of the Rules Committee, you're, you're not going to be able to draft a rule that, that fits all cases, and, and, and the tools to manage these things, I, in my opinion, are already out there. So, um, what was done in the case that I had, so first of all, we, there were very, very highly skilled lawyers on all sides or both sides of the case. Um, they, at least in the early stages, came up with an agreed upon, or largely agreed upon, structure for how to winnow cases. So there's been a lot of discussion here about lone pine orders, and I, I want to make sure that we're all understanding the terminology in the same way, because it doesn't mean one thing necessarily. So. Um, in, in the case that I have, if you set aside all the legal issues about preemption and adequacy of warnings and things like that, basically boils down to three issues. Uh, did you use the drug? Uh, do you have the type of injury that the drug is claimed to cause? And did the drug actually cause your injury? So it's possible for a look, what, what is referred to generically as a lone pine order to cover all three of those things. Um, including the last one, did the drug cause your injury? The tricky part is that that's something that's typically demonstrable only by expert testimony. And if you require that at the beginning of the case, it puts enormous burdens on people to do things really fast that they, in, in an average case, they don't have to do really fast. And so um, what we had in our case is what it's a sort of, I don't know if you call it a mini loan pine order or what, or what's called sometimes a plaintiff fact sheet, which basically dealt with questions of one and two, among some other things. In other words, you had to verify and provide information that you would use the drug, and you had to verify and provide information that you had the type of injury that the drug caused. And as Sam said, um, so the, the target audience is, is for this drug is basically three of the five people sitting up here. Um, and uh, uh, it, the drug is claimed to cause an increased incidence of heart attacks and blood clots. Uh, the, 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 the really tough part of the case is the specific causation. Question three, in other words, did the drug cause my injury? Because men in their 50s and 60s, typical man in your 50s and 60s, has all sorts of risk factors for these things. And in fact, it's even more complicated in this particular case is that some of the things that give you risk factors for the injuries also cause low testosterone. And so you've got a situation where you've got the, the, the target audience is basically consists of people who, who are actually potentially made more susceptible to the injury by the drug. Um, I, I opted not to uh, require the, the expert part of it at the early stage of the case because they didn't think it was appropriate to impose that kind of a burden and ended up with, I think it was somewhere between 7,800 and 7,900 cases and I'll just be blunt, I, I really didn't want to have to deal with 7,850 mini summary judgment motions. Um, it would, and I think I prefer to do other things with my life. Um, <laughs> And that's what I would have ended up with in all likelihood. I would have ended up with 7,850 7, motions to extend time saying the two months you've given us judge isn't enough time for us to find an expert witness. Uh, we still have to collect the medical records, they're not easy to find. We still have to collect the pharmaceutical records. You know, the pharmacy was a mom and pop, it went out of business, how do we find that stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So I didn't do that. Instead what happened is we provided, we required these fact sheets which essentially dealt with questions one and two, and we knew that we had people in the, uh, the, the purpose was to make sure that we had people in the MDL that, that had the types of injuries that were caused. Now, a certain number of cases actually dropped out at that point, because although you might have expected, and I guess I would have expected the plaintiff's lawyers to do this kind of vetting before the case was filed, it turned out at that point there were some of these people who actually hadn't used the drug or hadn't used the, the particular drugs that are at issue or really didn't have the injury. And in some situations, when they dug in a, a little more carefully, I think, and I'm sort of removed from the process, it was pretty clear that 
they didn't have the injury in as close of a temporal relationship with the use of the drug that the, the causation would have made sense. So some relatively modest number of cases dropped out at that point. And at the same time this was going on, um, the, what I'll call the common discovery process was going on, and the causation issue, or at least the general causation issue, largely got dealt with by means of Daubert motions and, uh, and a sort of mass summary judgment motion um, in which the defendants argued that the plaintiffs didn't have enough evidence that this drug caused this type of injury. And then at the same time, we were pulling out bellwether, trial balloon, whatever you want to call them, cases. And so a specific causation was dealt with in those cases. And the idea was is that we would have enough of a range of examples where the lawyers would be able to determine maybe what percentage of the cases would make it through that level of winnowing and we'd get to trial. Then we actually had trials. Um, nobody, the reason trials are vanishing is neither side really wants to have them. I mean, it's just that simple. Neither side really wants, I'm, I would be happy just trying cases. And in fact, the way I had set up the schedule for what's, I, I was supposed to be on trial on one of these right now uh, till the last uh, defendant settled. Um, I had recruited, um, I think it was 18 volunteer district judges from my district to try two to three week trials. And we had trials, probably 30 or 40 trials lined up between now and the middle of next year. And that's perfectly fine with me. I like trying cases. Uh, but lawyers don't like trying cases. A, they're expensive. It costs a million bucks, two million bucks to try to prepare and try one of these cases. Um, B, it's time consuming. And if you have to try a bunch of them, you have to get big teams of lawyers involved. And C, the results are unpredictable. So the first trial I had in one of these cases, uh, the, the verdict came back is, uh, for the plaintiff, zero compensatory damages and $150 million in punitive damages. Okay? Pause and think on that for a second. I had, I had to throw that one out and order a new trial. Second verdict came back, jury was a little bit more clever, uh, $150,000 in compensatory, $140 million in punitive damages. I ultimately had to throw that one out. Next one came back as a defense verdict, next one came back as a defense verdict, I think the next one came back as a defense verdict, Mr. Seagull, correct me if I'm wrong, he was involved in some of them. So, but they, they, were, they were out, they ended up with these results that basically told people things kind of on a big picture, but probably told them things they already knew. They told the defendants that you have a big conduct problem here. This was about off-label marketing. The drug was approved for this relatively small subset of people who had certain medical conditions, but you can't make much money off of that, so it was marketed to a much broader <coughs> population. And the juries, by their verdicts, were pretty ticked off about that. The verdicts also told the plaintiffs that they had a causation problem. It was hard to prove actual damages for people, or at least very much. I gotta tell you, if they didn't know that a year earlier, uh -uh. they're probably ought to, all ought to be in a different business at this point. So it, it got us somewhere, but it, it, it basically didn't accomplish a whole lot. And, and honestly, I think the way the case ultimately got settled is that there were some defendants that had um, a more modest number of cases that weren't in the market anymore that wanted to get out. That created some momentum for us, some sort of benchmarks for others to follow along with. And then secondly, when I, honestly, when I set up the schedule for these 30 trials for the next uh, nine months, everybody looked at that and said, that's about the last thing we want to do, and so they worked it out. So, so I have a question for, for, for you, Judge, and for Judge St. Eve, because I've, I've never quite understood what the remand is supposed to look like in a case like this. So you, you established through the Daubert hearings and the various processes, you set up the general causation. So then I get, I go to, I'm going to go to trial. I'm going to be, I'm going to be the bellwether. So I'm going to get there. I'm going to say, I had a heart attack or I had blood clotting and I took this testosterone medication. Well, there's a million reasons I could have had a heart attack. And so all of a sudden, it seems to me that the specific causation t uh, trial is going to be the same as the general causation trial because it's going to be the same experts presenting the same thing of the likelihood and all that. And Nothing about me, one of the things, principles of statistics is you can aggregate up, but you can't extrapolate down with any, with any certainty. And so I, I've never quite understood, what do you do when, I mean, you've both had the remand trials yeah, from mass torts. Right. What do you do? Well, I got several remands from the 
pelvic mesh litigation, as did Judge Kennelly. And the first thing the lawyers want to fight about is what did the MDL judge already decide? So <laughs> what they don't know is that we pick up the phone and say, okay, judge, did you decide this? <laughs> so it, that's never, if the judge already decided it, that's not an effective tactic for you to come in and say, well, you need to decide this because the judge, the MDL judge didn't. But the, the fight becomes specific causation. And that's usually the first issue that's raised. The summary judgments that the MDL judge doesn't do uh, come to you and they start fighting about specific causation. But, and I, but I just, I, I'm always curious in these cases, what evidence of specific causation could you introduce well, other so than the fact that they had the harm? So, so have, I think I tried seven of these, seven, seven cases, um, or maybe seven and a half, depending on how you count. Um, <laughs> yeah, try to forget about the half, it's a long story. Um, but, um, so the, the, the general causation expert sometimes is also the specific causation expert, but doesn't necessarily need to be. So usually, actually in my case, on the defense side, it was always different people. On the plaintiff side, it was sometimes different people, sometimes the same person. But the, so the way the trials looked that I tried is that you have witnesses testify about what's the mechanism by which taking this drug can or cannot cause this type of injury. And that's general causation. In other words, this stuff causes your blood to clot more by this and this and this mechanism. And blood clots can lead to pulmonary emboli, and they can lead to, to uh, cardiovascular events. The specific causation trial was always about what are all the risk factors that this particular plaintiff had, and how do you kind of dig through all of that and figure out whether it was this or this or this or all of this plus this or just this that caused the injury. So, that, so there is a difference. Um, there, there's, there's overlap, obviously, because the, the specific causation expert, if it's a different person, is relying on what the general causation expert said. But you can, do, you can do one of these trials. I mean, I actually tried one of the pelvic mesh cases on remand, and general causation had been determined. So that, was, that issue was kind of out. However, the expert who testified in the trial had to talk about it, because otherwise the jury wouldn't understand what they were talking about. So it, it's always going to be messy. So I, I he tried his first. And so the one that I had scheduled three weeks later settled based on his results. So I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> right. The number, by the way, is 14. I've tried 14. But, but so, so, but that's, I think that's key. Because if you take what, what John and Nora were saying about what role these few trials are trying to, to, to are, are supposed to play, I have the following hypothesis. I can't prove this, and, and I know that doctrinally you both have to reject this, but, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Um, and the hypothesis is that when you set up the bellwethers and somebody wants a summary, a defendant wants a summary judgment on a bellwether, you're disinclined to grant that because you just need trials to set values and you just want some things to go to trial. So even if you tossed those uh, verdicts that came in at almost no compensatories and no compensatories and huge punitives, you're signaling to the defendant a confirmation that you've got a big public relations problem because if this ever gets near a jury, you're going to get whacked. And so that's hugely important information, regardless of whether, as a standalone matter, this would ever have survived summary judgment and gotten to trial. So I, I read some of these cases, and it looks like you're trying to find ways to let cases go to trial so that you can get the trials. That's, that's the outside supposition, just reading between the lines. Yeah, of I, I, I really, I really, I guess I don't agree with that. So and then the first chunk of uh, bellwethers I had, I don't remember if it was 10 or 12, some of them actually dropped off before they got to the summary judgment process because the, the burden of having to go through that made it clear to the plaintiff's lawyer that they didn't have a case, and so they got dropped. Um, of the, I don't know, it was seven or eight, it was nine, I don't remember the number exactly, but, something I decided about a year and a half ago. Uh, I actually did kick out one or maybe two for lack of specific causation. Um, and, and honestly, in that one, I, to me at least, and this is, I'm not giving up any secrets, it's in my opinion that I wrote. Um, it, it was pretty clear that the expert was just trying to do whatever he could to you know, cobble together God knows what. And, kicked it. But in the other ones, I, I believed that, that there was, um, you know, legitimate evidence that 
was able to cull out the other allegedly confounding factors, at least in a way that, uh, that a jury could find in favor of the plaintiff, and, and they did in some of the cases. So, so I, I don't think that that's right. I mean, I think that um, I, I think that because you know, no, I like trying cases. I don't like trying cases that are a waste of time. And um, and I, I wouldn't have tried the one where there was no causation evidence because why would I want to try? A week's worth of a plaintiff's case and just kick it out under Rule 50 anyway, or just you know another week and a half and have a jury you know, find against them. It doesn't make any sense. Now there is an issue about bellwether trials when you set them up. Um, what has happened, a phenomenon that happens in a, in a number of these cases, is that you know even though all of the lawyers on both sides will come into you and say, well, we we really want to have representative cases, judge right? representative cases. So that's the only. Way. Really, I mean, these are lawyers, right? No, really what happens is that the plaintiffs want to have good plaintiff cases and the defendants want to have good defendant cases. So you have this risk that rather than having all this, you're going to have this and this. And, and maybe that's what happened. But So what happens in some of these situations is that the bellwether trials that get set up and you're trying a case in February and one in March and one in April and one in May and so on. And if it's a good case for the plaintiff, the defendant settles it right before trial. If you don't have a trial. Good case for the defendant, Plaintiff drops it before trial, don't have a trial. Good case for the, and so on. And that actually happened in a, in a pretty good sized MDL that a colleague of mine had had that was a little bit further along than me. And since we're always fighting the previous war, um, I didn't want to have that happen. And so I basically told him, here's your 10 bellwether cases. If you settle one, two, three, four, it, here's your trial dates. If you settle one, two, three, four, number five goes to trial on the first date. If you settle five, number six goes to trial. So it kept moving up. And, and, you know, we can all have a long discussion about whether something works or not. What does that mean? I'll let the folks at the other end of the table talk about that. That's a deep thought. It's beyond my pay grade. Um, but, uh, but it worked, and we had a bunch of trials, and, and you know, we got some information out of it. So let me ask this question a different way for, of Nora and John, then. Um, if my hypothesis, which I'm going to stick to anyway, Judge, with all with all due respect, as you're supposed well, to say in court, yeah. To, right? um, and just if, so you know, I'm I'm affirming Judge Canelli. Okay. <laughs> my, my suspicion is that when the general causation is strong, there's a thumb on the scale in favor of a la finding enough specific causation. A thumb on the scale, not just by the thumb on the scale to let the cases, some cases, go to trial. So, Nora. Is, I mean, I think where John might end up is that good, you know, because he doesn't care. It's all representative in his view. But you're actually concerned about legal truths and merits and stuff. You don't teach at Yale. So, so, um, uh, so would that be a good thing if we relaxed the, uh, if we relaxed the mechanisms of specific causation when you have a mass case so that you can get more representative uh, matters to trial? Well, so I think in so many of these cases, in terms of specific causation, again, this is not when there's a signature disease, that's really easy. Um, we're, we're, it's going to be a coin flip. It's how we're, you know, did this person's heart attack, was it caused by Vioxx? And maybe we can, you know, really drill down on the person and rule out a couple of, you know, these are other confounding variables which we don't think caused the heart attack. But I think we're, a reasonable person is very often going to say, like, maybe, you know, 50-50. And then once you're at 50-50, it's really hard to say, and I'm sure it's not 50.0001 for the plaintiff. And of course, if it's 50.0001 for the plaintiff, the plaintiff wins that case. And the plaintiff ought to win that case. Um, and so I think where we really, you know, Science is not going to give us the answer, I don't think, realistically, of whether this heart attack was caused by, by Vioxx. And I think in that circumstance, the right answer is to say, you know, it's a coin flip. Uh, where that's the case or anything really kind of close to that, the right answer is to give it to the jury. Now, and do I think, you know, behind the closed doors of the jury box, the jury is going to be affected in its determination of specific causation? of whether or not uh, the general causation is strong, whether or not it looks like that if they're engaged in really shady conduct, whether or not, frankly, the plaintiff is, is likable and personable. I think all those things come in, um, and, and that's the kind of realist perspective. But I think should it go there? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so John, I, I take it you would agree with that, that, that if, 
if the MDL is, uh, to follow your, uh, your metaphor, is just the visible tip of the iceberg of an entire system that's based on taking a couple of representative cases to trial for valuation purposes every so often or to define the causation standards, then you would also be in favor of trying to push through some to trial. Uh, I, I think the, 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 thing, the thing that we can say, I think, is that it looks like the tort system sometimes is able to do things relatively well at a population or aggregate level. Uh, whether it does things well in an individual case-by-case -case level is, 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 um, is beyond me to be able to tell you, and, and, uh, and I suspect it has, it's full of flaws and screw-ups. Uh, but we could hope for effectiveness at the, at the aggregate at the aggregate level. There's one specific thing that I, I have to clarify for, for Judge Kennelly, which is I'm not yet in my 50s. I wanted this to be. <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 the particular toxic, the, the, the toxic masculinity crisis of heart attack and testosterone, it's in my near future. <laughs> I'm not quite. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So po population level, I mean, I think, you know, in any, in any individual case, if it were useful to the parties to, 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 to use a particular case but, as a bellwether, but then John, that, 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 that sort of ducks the question a little bit because... Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> we, well, yeah no, no, I, I've Faster, known John... Of course it does. <laughs> I, I've known John for years. So, so, but, so let me push you a little bit more on that because you say it does it well at the aggregate level, but the tools we have for determination of fault uh, and level of culpability and comp compensation uh, amounts. Uh, outside of settlement, the tools we have in the tort system are purely individual based. And so I don't know, I mean, we're trying to, you know, the thing about the MDL process is so fascinating is it's kind of an in intuitive, learned process of how judges figure out how to make a bunch of individual cases into an aggregate case and then get individual level determinations back. But what do you do when you don't have the, the tools for this, this kind of trying something globally? I mean, what, the closest we get is the Daubert hearings in, before the MDL judges, I think. Uh, well, I guess this is really, I think there are more expert folks in the room on this than, than I am, but I, I would, my initial reaction is to think that um, uh, that the bigger crisis would be um, things like selection effects and other strategic um, uh, opportunities available to parties which could skew the extent to which any one case could be representative. That is, that's, that is uh, um, I would think bellwethers could be useful, but, I, but the selection effects, and this is actually something I'd love to know, it sounds like Judge Kennelly has a, had a great strategy for solving selection effects with your, your ranked order of cases. But the selection effects are something that I think trial judges must struggle with because they're going to be subject to them and susceptible without even being able to know. Um, uh, and so that's something I think I would worry about more than the accuracy of individual cases. So Judge St. Eve, how do, you deal, how do you deal with that? Or how did you deal with that in your 16 years on the trial bench? The, well, the cases I had all ended up settling before we got to the bellwether stage um, for, for various legal, factual, other reasons. So we didn't get there. But I think Judge Kennelly's approach, first of all, uh, not necessarily relying on the advocacy of either side to pick what they think are the best cases, but to pick some set of random cases to go and then to put them in that order and keep the pressure on, on the lawyers that these are going. Um, so if you want to settle, that's fine, but just be prepared on the next one is a very effective strategy. Well, there's another strategy that we've talked about in the past, um, and that is that the judges are creating a non-jury trial-like environment around this, what they think the central issue in the case is. And so you sometimes have uh, not just the science days of educating the court, but a second science day in the context of a motion to eliminate or the context of a Daubert hearing, and you put the experts back to back um, some judges have experimented, some American judges, with what in Australia is cheerfully called hot tubbing of experts, where you put both of them in the well, and sometimes with lawyers uh, conducting the, uh, the investigation, sometimes the judge takes over and it's like an inquisitorial court in Europe conducting. Uh, is, is that, are those the mechanisms that help move this along? The, the hot tubbing. 
leave it to lawyers to try to come up with a, a sexy term for expert. Hot <laughs> 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 topic. But this is something, a new technique that some judges are just starting to use in the United States. And as Sam described it, it involves experts for both the plaintiff and the defendant testifying at the same time. But the idea is you put them both in the witness box, which is like a hot tub. And they get to present their positions, and then the experts get to question each other. And then the judge gets to question if she wants to. And the lawyers may get to question at that point, depending on how the judge has structured it. And the thought is that if you have the experts testifying together, for one, whoever the trier of fact is, if it's before the jury or a Daubert before the judge, that you get to see them back to back rather than separated by time, which you can often forget, uh, what, or lose some of the focus if it's separated by a couple weeks of testimony. And if the experts are questioning each other, that they're more apt to narrow the issues and it'll make it more efficient. Uh, not a lot of judges in this country have done that yet. I've spoken with Judge Zuhari in Ohio who has tried it. He thinks it's wonderful uh, for those very reasons. I don't know that the lawyers are advocating for this, which may be why the judges aren't doing, because if you proceed the hot tub method, the lawyers are losing some control, which we know lawyers never like to do. So uh, I don't know if any lawyers in here have tried it out. I'd be curious. Chris, have you ever done that? I was talking about a case coming up where uh, I think we successfully talked that judge out of the hot tub. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But, but he wants to It's typical that when an expert testifies during a Daubert hearing that the other side's expert is always in the room uh, to give advice and to know what he or she may have to testify about. But to do it simultaneously, to take it at the same time, I, I would have liked to have tried that. But Matt, maybe you could try it. Yeah, I, well, no, hopefully not, because I think I've settled my case. But I, <laughs> Your but, next uh, one. Yeah, I, um, I, I did that once in a, in a, in a trademark uh, infringement case. There's always experts about likelihood of confusion. Had to have a hearing, and they both testified one right after the other. And quite honestly, I, I, I didn't think it was added much to the, to the process, other than it's a long day. What I do think might be effective, and what I wish lawyers would do a little bit more of, is in advance of these issues going forward, having their experts meet the experts together and see if they can narrow the issues before bringing them to the court. Because my guess is if you put the, in some cases, if you put the experts in the same room, and the lawyers could go in there if they wanted as well, that they could look at this from whatever their expertise is and say, okay, well, some of these things we're arguing about really aren't issues. Here are what the main issues are. And then present them to the court. Okay, let's uh, open this up. Uh, there. Anybody have any question about how you handle the case? Because we've resolved most of these issues uh, at this point. Great. So I can't resist because this is Troy McKenzie, who's yeah, one so of our directors um, here and uh, colleague here. Th this is a question for both uh, the. Yale law professor, and also for the for the judges. That's still a good thing, right? Yeah, yes, of course, it's a it's a it's a great thing. Um, these questions ultimately tend to be questions of state law, and you're applying, in, you know, in a in a in a tort case. At the end of the day, you're applying state law. You're in federal court. Um, does that at all affect for the judges how comfortable you are making determinations on questions that might pop up during trial? Or do you view this as really matters of the rules of evidence, matters of procedure, and then it goes to the jury? And the, the, the Daubert type questions or the other types of expert questions tend to be more about just the science. You really don't pay attention to the nuances of state law or where the state courts might be going in how they interpret uh, and develop uh, tort law. And I don't know, John, if you have thoughts about that as well. Well, this, the state law, it, the short answer is that doesn't 
impact how, certainly how I'm doing things. The state law will come up in the jury instructions, uh, um, but in terms of the Daubert and the federal rules of evidence and the trial doesn't. Yeah, there's one little place that it that it does, um, and that is it, it, the the way the particular law of the particular state defines causation can sometimes have some interaction with the with the Daubert standard. But honestly, you know, there's it's not like every state's different from every other state. There's a couple or three baskets, and and you know, you're either in this basket or that basket, and. And, and those are the kinds of things that tend to get hashed out before trial. Once you get to trial, uh, generally speaking, except for the jury instructions, the, the other things that have come up are evidence questions, and those are all federal law. And procedural questions also federal law. So, uh, I mean, and in terms of the discomfort factor, I mean, as district judges, we're kind of the last of the generalists, and so if, if, if you have discomfort dealing with unfamiliar areas of the law, then I suggest you get a new job. Because that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But so, John, let me uh, ask you something following Troy's question to get you involved. Um, there does seem to be, in certain areas of law, a gravitation toward federal court of what had traditionally been state law claims. Um, there are some areas where we have relatively new causes of action, like electronic privacy type things, where because of the Class Action Fairness Act and other uh, uh, matters, you see the shift of a new area of law purporting to develop under state law, but in fact developing in federal court. The prominence of the preemption determinations in these kind, in the cases that we're talking about here, means that very often uh, questions of state law that are relatively unresolved at the state level are going to have to be uh, addressed by federal courts under the guise of a preemption ruling. Do you see a, sh a gravitational pull toward federal court in, in the doctrinal evolution of tort? I mean, is this something that uh, that is you know, it's not just a procedural issue that we're looking at, but we're looking at a new area for generating substantive law. I don't know. I haven't studied this particular question, but I'm not sure I see that see that trend. I mean, I think um, uh, I, I'd say the crisis for the development of the substantive area of tort law is settlement. Right? That is to say, there's so few cases that end up going to uh, state supreme courts producing, uh, right now my students and I are doing a study of um, the enforceability of waivers, uh, the, the waivers that you sign at birthday parties for kids and climbing rot walls and all, and, and it's actually extremely difficult to tell what the enforceability is in laws because there just aren't enough decided cases, which goes to the, the pervasiveness of settlement. So I think less a shift in where the cases are getting generated to an absence of, uh, of, of cases, what I would, would say. Well, our, our colleague here, uh, Kathy Sharkey, who was, of course, our colleague before at, at Columbia, um, is finding that there are areas where if you do want to see written opinions, you have to look at the federal courts and the preemption cases, mm -hmm. analyzing what they think the state law cases are, which is, and these are, as you said, this is one of the main issues you have to confront right at the threshold stage in any MDL is the, is the, is the did, did you, did you, you didn't address, you didn't encounter that, the sense that, uh, uh, Judge Saini, the, the sense that state law is just not where it's at anymore. I have not encountered that or thought of it like that. Judith? Hi, Judith Resnick. I, I went to NYU and I teach at Yale, so I'm a twofer. Um, so, uh, first, thank you. Uh, second, just apropos, the issue of the decline of law because of what Arthur was talking about in terms of mandated arbitration means that the ALI project on consumers and products and contracts is beset by the problem that there isn't any law to restate except maybe federal statements of state law for consumer or consent. So this issue is, a, is cutting across all of the different arenas in groups and individual litigation. I just was wondering, this is a lot about the information uh, the um, lone pine tree standing issues and the um, bellwether trials. What is your sense from the bench about how good the feedback loop is to the lawyers who are not on the MDL PSC about the information? You've all kind of focused on judges generating information 
through decision making and individual, and then there's the PSC, but then there's the group of lawyers who are out there. And I'm wondering first from the bench, how you see and whether from the bench you could force more information exchange to maximize the utility of the work that you're doing. Well, so the, the short answer is I don't honestly know. Um, and, and maybe I should. So the, 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 the tricky part is how you, how you communicate the result of a two-week trial to a, a bunch of people who weren't there, and it's it, it's really hard to do. Um, you know, people come into a trial thinking, and it, for those of you who've tried cases, either as a, as a presiding over them as a judge or as a lawyer, and I've done both. I mean, it, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen, and it's really hard to tell exactly why things happen the way they did. And of course, the jury for most lawyers is a complete black box. It's maybe a gray box for the judges. We get to talk to them, but. You know, who knows how good the information is we get. So I, I don't know, um, and I'm not sure what information gets communicated. I mean, you can imagine, okay, verdict, that's easy. Everybody can read that. But how well did the expert do, and, and, and how, you know, how do these causation, you know, alternative causation issues feed into other cases? I really don't know how that gets done. I mean, there's people in the room who do, but I'm not one of them. I don't know how it's disseminated, but I know in... MDL cases in appointing counsel and in ordering that original structure of counsel, then I try to incorporate some type of liaison counsel or whatever title you want to give the individual who's responsible for disseminating information to the other lawyers. The other thing too is the lawyers come to these to the hearings in the MDLs. You, it isn't just the the steering committee or the main lawyers in the courtroom. The courtrooms are filled with the lawyers coming in. So there are lawyers who are there for themselves taking in the information, and I'm sure they disseminate it in some way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, th thanks so much. Uh, so I had a question that I think connects quite directly Zach to Clotten Professor from, uh, Zach Lofton from Cornell. Cornell. Uh, and a former uh, piece of candy in both Judge Kennelly and Judge St. Eve's courtrooms uh, in Chicago. Judge St. Eve is a proud graduate of your school, so. Oh. Oh, I know. So do them, do them well. <laughs> that, that's right. Um, so I was wondering, when you're dealing with these various issues, uh, in the context of class actions, we think a lot about potential conflicts of interest within the class. Uh, and similar conflicts can exist among plaintiffs in these mass tort cases. And I'm wondering whether, when you're making these decisions, you're actively thinking about the potential for conflicts of interest? And if so, what steps judges can take to police those or surface those or react to those conflicts? Or whether you simply leave that to counsel since we are dealing with mostly represented parties can in these I cases. Can ask a question about your question? When you say making these decisions, which ones are you talking about? So these could be the Lone Pine decisions. These could be the epidemiology. These could be selecting bellwethers. And when you say conflicts, you mean that different groups of plaintiff's lawyers may have different views about how it ought to be done? Exactly. Well, sure. I mean, that's an issue because, by, you know, by definition, the people on the steering committees tend to be the people who are more active. And, you know, to the extent that you have, you know, let's say the late night TV advertising lawyers, like, have you taken this drug? Did you have a, you, know, you may be entitled to compensation who just kind of maybe potentially file cases without vetting them. You, you know that those people would prefer to do as little work as possible, but you can't really kind of let it go that way. Um, so, yeah, the conflicts are out there. and. Anybody, the, the way MDLs work is that everybody gets notice of everything. Anybody could come into court and say, no judge, we shouldn't have to do these plaintiff fact disclosures, plaintiff fact sheets for the following reasons. I mean, I don't think that really happens very much. The, the one time where you get the sort of the, the, the teeming masses, if you will, objecting is when it comes down to dividing up the pot. And I have one of those issues right now about how much the how much the steering committee gets and how much everybody else gets, and all of a sudden there's, of course, objections because now it's about something real. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Thank you. Uh, Sheila Burnvale. Um, I've been really impressed about how federal judges have been approaching Daubert, and up until about two, three years ago, I thought the fact that you could use Daubert to get rid of a MDL on general causation <coughs> was almost impossible because, uh, not because how Daubert was used, because judges 
were reluctant to dismiss a whole MDL. And now we have at least two examples, if not more, the Zoloft cases <coughs> and the um, Lipitor cases in which uh, we had two MDLs, thousands of cases in Lipitor dismissed on summary judgment because the judge found, uh, Judge Gergel in South Carolina found that uh, the plaintiff's experts did not meet the Daubert requirements and uh, got rid of most of them and then granted summary judgment and was affirmed by the Fourth Circuit. So the federal judges are taking Daubert very seriously. They listen very carefully. They write long decisions. And to me, in the right situations, Daubert is really an important tool in the toolbox as to general causation. Now, some people might not like the results, uh, but there got to be an even playing field. And the science becomes so important in many of these toxic tort or, uh, or uh, pharmaceutical cases. Uh, and these generalities really don't play very well when you, when you dig down. So I was just wondering what the judges' experiences have been. Is there any shift that you uh, see in the federal courts as uh, judges are approaching Daubert? I think part of this, Sheila, is what you said about the defense bar recognizing this now, that there is more of a focus on Daubert's than there used to be. And as I said at the beginning of the panel, I have seen a shift. And I, there was a case somewhere down south, I can't remember which one it was, where the court did expert discovery first before fact and then threw the case out on the expert issue. I think because of that case in part and the education of the defense bar that there's more of a focus from the defense bar on Daubert's now because they, they realize the potential power of them. So I don't know if the shift is as much from what's coming from the courts as to what you're presenting to us. Yeah, I, I think it's it's pretty common. It was it was a proposal by the defense in my case, not at the beginning because there was a, an agreed upon process, but then there was a change of counsel and then there was a proposal to kind of flip the process in the same way to do, to, let's just do the causation discovery first. Um, and it was essentially presented to me like, because we know we're going to win the summary judgment motion. Um, and and I, de I declined to do it for a variety of reasons. And, and frankly, I, in retrospect, I'm glad I did because if I hadn't done it that way, it would have added three years onto the case. But I, I do think that there is, you know, more, as Judge St. Eve said, more of a recognition on the defense side that, that this can be a, a tool for, you know, hopefully on their, from their point of view, trying to dispose of the case from the get-go, and you know, it's just like anything else, though. It's a strategy question because if you try to, if, if 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 you try to hit the grand slam home run on the first pitch, and you know, and you whiff, then it's not really terribly good for you. So you got to pick your spots. So Nora, this this is consistent with what you're advocating. Am I right? Well, so I mean, I think getting general causation right is really hard, and it's not going to, you know, happen with fact sheets, and it's not going to happen easily. So, absolutely, you know, a way to get general causation right is to scrutinize experts, um, you know, as as permitted and, and authorized under, you know, Daubert and evidentiary rules. Uh, so, I think I think that's fine. I think you know, it's when we do things, you know, in a really short circuited way and through the back door that I start to worry a little. We have time for one more one question. More? Thank you. Uh, my name is William Lim. I'm uh, not an expert federal practitioner by any means. Um, so this is um, maybe a bit of a basic question concerning the judicial management of MDLs, um, particularly in light of um, the comments about Lone Pine orders um, and the whole, you know, the, the conveyor belt candy, you know, as well as the takeaway from the previous panel concerning, you know, are more or different federal rules needed to manage MDLs. So the sort of basic question that, that I have in concerning judicial management um, and, you know, the, the effectiveness of Lone Pines or, or you know, Judge Kennelly, your system of, of scheduling trials. 
um, taking uh, the 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 whole approach um, that was done when when e discovery was new and hot and you know nobody knew what they were doing and then finally um, the the bench and the bar and and the academy were able to come to some consensus through the, the Sedona principles. Is there something similar? Is there a similar push to 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 replicate that consensus building process, at least in terms of the management of the cases? Maybe not so much going into the substantive um, evidentiary issues that that some of the other questions, you know, about causation and and whatnot. But at least in terms of, you know, uh, building a consensus, for example, around hot tubbing, building a consensus around other sorts of um, effective management so that you don't get to that whole, you know, uncontrollable conveyor belt, uh, uh, you know, outcome. I wouldn't say there's a concerted effort to come to a consensus. And you have to remember that all of these cases are different. And it is not a one size fits all. That what works in one case just may not work in another case. The, Multi-district litigation panel does put on a conference every year for judges where experienced MDL judges share their experiences and talk about what worked for them and what didn't work for them. The, the Judge Canellis and Judge Fallons of the world who are very experienced in MDLs I know are available to consult and advise with other judges who come on to MDLs, but there isn't a, a, an organized fashion such as the Sedona principles. But I don't know that that would work here because again, it is not one size fits all. I, I go ahead, Mark. Oh, so I would say, I say I would absolutely agree with that. That there has to be. You know, I loved the the jazz metaphor, right? There has to be improvisation on these cases. I think what we need to recognize, and judges, well, judges need to have a, a big toolkit to draw from. I think we need to have our eyes open and be realistic about what the toolkit contains, what it ought to contain, and the kind of comparative advantage and, and, and possibilities of tools within that toolkit. So we can't expect you know, this tool to be the be all end all. We can't, you know, in my view, we can't use a Lone Pine order early in the case to get the specific causation. That's nutty. If we do that, we're gonna short circuit things and, and kind of be moving backwards. Uh, but maybe Lone Pine orders can be used, you know, sometimes. Daubert hearings, I think, can be used sometimes. But we need to make sure judges, I think, have the full array of tools at their disposal with a sophisticated understanding of what the possibilities and the drawbacks and the advantages of, of what each, you know, tool provides. In the time I've been around MDLs, um, as a lawyer, as I, I've been privileged to attend this conference of uh, MDL judges on several occasions and as an academic writing about it, I've been increasingly impressed by the reserve capacity that the judiciary has built in for handling the kinds of problems that test our legal system. I think that's what the MDL process has become and the statistics on, that I started the presentation with about 92% of what they do is dealing with the mass torts. We haven't figured out where else to put them and so the judiciary has taken this reserve power and basically figured out how to handle this. I think a lot of the demands for more rules are just to disable this process. And I am not a fan of rulemaking here because these cases tend to be one-off events. Um, when I'm at conferences and people start talking about how we need rules for this and rules for that, my reactions are twofold. First of all, every MDL will then begin with a set of motions to be relieved from the obligations of this rule, that rule, and that rule, and so you will immediately uh, laden this with more cost and uh, and delay because you now have to fight over getting out from under a, a series of rigid rules. The other is I always ask people, tell me what rule you're going to write ex ante, anticipating that somebody's going to blow out half the Gulf of Mexico. You know, just tell me you know the range of things that are going to come up in that kind of a case and how you're going to set out the rules for handling a dispute that has states that are sovereign and and uh, all kinds of admiralty issues. I mean, it's just, it, it seems to me to be a fool's errand that's mostly designed to slow down the capacity of the judiciary to respond. 
um, on that cheery note. I'm a fan. I'm a fan of the judges. I, I, I think they do a great job. I think this is these are hard cases, and I think they do a great job. So can we thank the panel? To the judges.